Paul Trowler from uh, Department of Education Research, Lancaster University. Um, and uh, I've been asked to talk about our projects on student engagement. And I'm going to talk until about 10 past 10, and then there'll be 10 minutes for, for comments, uh, questions if you have them, and so on. Uh, there were two projects, one funded by the Higher Education Academy and one funded by the Leadership Foundation for Higher Education consecutively. Uh, and that's quite nice because for the first project, what we did was to do a huge literature review. Uh, Vicky Crowler and myself, she's my wife, hence the, hence the same name. Um, and uh, Vicky did the, did the work on that, so I acknowledge that straight away. Uh, it's a 20,000 word literature review, and poor Adrian was telling me that he had it dumped on his desk just the other day. <laughs> it takes some getting through. Uh, but there is a summary as well, uh, which is one of the outputs from that project of, uh, of, of that. And also a summation of kind of what we know. The Americans would say, I think, 10 things we know for sure about student engagement. Well, not quite that crass, but you know, some of the things that the more rigorous research uh, can tell us and we can be fairly robust about in terms of uh, our understanding of student engagement. We also did some, uh, some case studies from secondary data of uh, highly engaged institutions and the kinds of things that, that they did. And we were able to follow that up with the second study, uh, funded by the Leadership Foundation, to go and interview leaders. Um, and leaders here not meant in a sort of formal terms, like vice chancellors or uh, you know, uh, heads of department or deans or whatever in universities. Uh, but leaders of students and leaders of courses and so on. We're all leaders in a sense and we're also all followers. So it's a, it's a very flexible concept. And of course we were in, interested in uh, it's about student engagement, so we were interested in interviewing uh, student leaders as well. And so uh, we developed out of that a toolkit for leaders, and I'll briefly be showing you that. Uh, yeah. All of these resources, all of these deliverables are of course available web, both at the Higher Education Academy's website and the Leadership Foundation's uh, website, but also as one of the deliverables we set up a Sakai site, Sakai if you don't know it is an open source um, web 2.0 thing where you can, um, you can uh, contribute as well as download, and so we've, uh, we've put all those resources up there and those discussions and so on uh, for people who are involved with student engagement. So there's Quite a lot of resources out of those two uh, projects. And what I want to do in this talk really is to think a little bit with you about what student engagement is. It's one of those terms that's thrown around a lot. And it's, of course it's a hot term, uh, it's a sexy term at the moment, everybody's thinking about it, hence the funding of these two projects in quick succession and you know, lots of uh, invitations like this one to come and give talks about it. Um, but uh, it's used in a very flexible way. Marx, Karl Marx, uh, talks about chaotic conceptualizations, and I think that's quite a useful uh, idea. You know, the fact that what is like proletarianization and uh, capitalism and so on are used in, in, in many, many different ways. And I think it's really important for us to try to pin down what we mean by terms if we're actually going to take action about them. So I'd like to talk a little bit about that. And I'd also like to think about the implementation issues, and this is where I come in, really, the implementation side of it. Vicky, as I say, did the hard work of going through all that literature uh, on student engagement. But I uh, brought what little brain I have to the question of, okay, well, what do we do about it then? Uh, and that's my, my special. Um, of course, if you, if you if, well, as I say, it's a very flexible term. What, how do you review literature on student engagement when, if you begin to think about it, almost all teaching and learning is about student engagement? You know, you go back to Socrates, <laughs> um, uh, and the Socratic method and so on, that's about student engagement. So what we had to do on that literature review was to uh, only look at the literature that, that self-identified about it, that itself about, as being about student engagement. Um, thinking about the implementation side, <coughs> what I want to do is to bring a little bit of theory uh, to that. I, I don't think you can understand change unless you understand stasis, how the social world works. Well, of course, we don't really fully understand it, but we can theorize about it and we can try to uh, 
suggest ways in which uh, it works, which we can then um, apply in terms of thinking about change. And Paul mentioned uh, Girardi's work and, uh, and work at uh, Management School at Lancaster, much of which is based on communities of practice theory, activity systems theory, and so on. Uh, a broad body of what would be called social cultural, uh, sociocultural theory. I want to uh, bring, uh, say a few words about social practice theory, which is part of that, that uh, body of work. And really, social practice theory says we shouldn't concentrate too much on individuals and what individuals do. We should think about groups and how they develop the social world, how they develop meaning, how they develop sets of practices, recurrent practices that often are invisible to them. They don't think about them, they just think of them as normal. And sets of feelings, uh, and sets of assumptions, and sets of evoked responses that are really significant and that are picked up as newcomers come in uh, to the situation and, and so on. So there are ways of going on, if you like, both among students and, and academics and others, uh, that might facilitate or might obstruct student engagement. So th this focus on leaders, we should be a bit careful about. You know, there's only so much that individual people can do. And obviously, we're in a social world at a meso level, this social construction uh, of, of, of reality to some extent. And we're also in a world, of course, that is structured by uh, you know, the, the, the economic system we're in, the, the political culture that we're in, uh, and so on. For example, the stress on students as consumers. Uh, that whole flow of thinking, of ideology, if you like, of course impinges on questions of student engagement. So taking a social practice approach to all this means that um, <clears throat> we uh, should be really careful about focusing too much on individuals. Of course, individuals can do things. Uh, but we should also think about uh, context, uh, how recurrent practices and so on have developed in particular contexts. And therefore, it's, it's a, a, a bit difficult to sort of say, OK, this works for student engagement in one place, in all the evidence that we've looked at. Therefore, that's what we should do. Because contexts are different, recurrent practices are different, assumptions, values, emotions, emotional responses, and so on are different. So any um, innovation that wants to bring, that wants to enhance student engagement really needs to be low resolution. Not too much in the way of big visions fully developed, but broad sets of aims that can be domesticated, to can fit in to some extent, and also change to some extent uh, the, the practices that are already there. Innovations come preloaded with, with uh, sets of uh, responses and so on, as, as market products do. <clears throat> and so people in particular situations will respond to them in particular ways and will perhaps ignore them, will change them, reshape them and so on. In other words, they will domesticate them uh, in, in particular ways. Okay, so that's a little kind of introduction. Uh, to where, where uh, we're coming from on this. I will be asking you to do one short uh, thing and also to do a little bit of reflection uh, in a second. So I won't be talking all the time. <coughs> okay, Marx, chaotic conceptualizations. Let's try to unpick what student engagement actually means before we begin to think about what we might do about it if we think we, we need to do anything about it. Okay, there's the first substantive slide then. As you can see, it suggests that engagement has these three uh, dimensions, three aspects. Behavioural, cognitive and affective. What people do, what people think and how people feel. And <clears throat> I'll, I'll explore a little bit that, uh, that further with that in a moment. And in the literature, you can say that also students might have a congruent or conforming and what they call oppositional or negative or rebellious kind of uh, dimension to it as well. 
and the language of that second one is quite difficult. So obviously if, if a student is engaged, they're taking on the uh, assignment that you've asked them to do, they're working as you want them to do and so on, they're conforming. But uh, some of the literature tends to say, okay, well there's, all, there's also the oppositional dimension as well. They're engaging, but they're challenging, they're opposing and so on. And often that's situated as being a bad thing. Think about students, was it last year or the year before, uh, demonstrating in London about the fees and what you know, it was sort of in the news, wasn't it, and so on. Oppositional. They're engaging, for sure, but they're engaging, they're challenging. Well, like for me, I don't know what you think, I would say, yeah, that's a good thing, that's necessary, that's higher education. If they're not doing that, we're in trouble. So this language of opposition, negativity, and so on, I worry about it. Innovative purposes. But you can see that it could go in one of two ways. The goody-goody student who engages and does what they're told, and or the student who engages but says, hang on, this is rubbish. No, I don't want to be assessed like that. I want to be assessed like that. this. The, the curriculum is wrong, and so on. So, and of course, feel, feelings and actions and thoughts are involved in all of that. There's our draft. It's going to be draft forever. Is, we did this for the HEA, our draft definition. They said, oh, no, don't like that. We said, well, what would you prefer? Mm, I don't know. But people won't agree with that. <coughs> well, okay. Tough, but you have to have a definition of something. You can't, you can't, you know, it's this chaotic conceptualization thing. You can't use a word and not try and define it at least. I think the key thing about this one for me <coughs> is that it places the emphasis on both the students and the institution. You know? uh, there's a lot of emphasis on one or the other in the literature. Sometimes governments place all the emphasis on the institutions, on academics and so on, useful. Um, the, there's a thing in the literature called the magic effect, you know, if we do this then it will just happen by, by, by magic uh, in some way. Well, no, it needs effort and time and so on uh, and in, you know, intelligence um, for, uh, from both sides, from students and academics and, and of course, the blended professionals that are also involved in uh, teaching and learning. And you can see, too, we've added, uh, as well as uh, enhancing, optimizing the experience and, and enhancing learning outcomes and development of students, also the performance and reputation of institutions. And that prefigures something I'm going to talk about in a second, about what student engagement is for. We tend to take that into as, as red, but actually there are multiple objectives of student engagement, and senior managers may have one set of objectives which might be the reputation of the institution going up the lead tables and so on, particularly lead tables about student engagement. Academics will have another one and so on. And that's often a good thing. I did a study years ago about uh, the credit framework, you know, CATS and the assignment of, uh, <coughs> of credit value to assess learning, which spread across the country very quickly in the 80s uh, without the direction being from, uh, from above. Why? Well, I think one of the reasons was there were multiple um, objectives behind <coughs> them. And so all sorts of people at different levels and different, if you like, educational ideologies could subscribe to it and be in favour of it. And I think the same is true of student engagement. So it's, it's, you know, it's quite an optimistic thing that actually there are multiple purposes, multiple agendas behind the student's engagement uh, initiative. Okay, I think this slide is particularly important um, because it pulls out uh, these three foci of student engagement. When we talk about student engagement, I don't know about you, but I, I tend to think about learning and teaching, student engagement in the learning process. At first, because I'm teaching. <coughs> you know, how do we get them in class to, how do we get them in a lecture to listen and you know, process the stuff? How do we get them in a workshop, a seminar, a tutorial, in class, to be involved, to speak, to read the stuff, and so on. And then further along from that kind of thing, perhaps maybe we could be involved them in 
designing the syllabus, uh, in designing the assessment, in being involved in assessment, and so on. So there's a whole sort of spectrum on that first one that you could, you could go on. Then there's the question of structure and process, another, another kind of axis, if you like. Um, in other words, things like uh, student representatives, course representatives, uh, appearing at departmental committees or and having their, their input going on to the governing bodies of institutions, centres or whatever it is that you have against student representatives. Giving a voice to students through some kind of democratic uh, system. And again, you've got an axis there from you know, fairly limited involvement to actually being involved in selecting staff uh, and, and other things that some people would say, for others, it would be perfectly normal. <coughs> One of my current PhD students, Phil Carey, at uh, the Paul John Moores, is doing a study on this, and he, he makes the point, and it's quite a telling point, I think, that so often uh, the student uh, representative system is simply reactive. We didn't like this, we didn't like that, and so on. It's not actually involved in a in an involved way, you know, in a positive way, in a, in a creative way. It's, it's a consumer uh, kind of uh, situation. So again, you're thinking about an axis on the uh, uh, spectrum of the on this axis. And then third one, and that, for me this one is particularly important, is identity, student identity. How do they feel? Again, it comes to this affective design. Do they feel part of the institution? Are, they, are students engaged? with the institution and do they feel that they're part of um, your institution? Do they proudly say, you know, this is me? Do they get involved in extracurricular uh, stuff and so on? I think Lancaster's quite lucky accidentally because of its collegiate system. And there students feel part, not of Lancaster University, but of Cartmel College or you know, some other college. And that nobody thought about that. They just copied <laughs> but actually, in terms of student engagement and identity, it was a clever thing to do, accidentally. <laughs> and, you know, a lot of the American work on minority ethnic groups in higher education talk about the revolving door of higher education. You know, people come in, they see that this is a white institution, they don't feel, but it's for them what the class people and so on. And so they, they're, they're out of the end. And that issue of identity and engagement in that sense, who students feel that they are, is really important. And it's one that isn't much um, considered in the literature. Uh, and I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. So as I say, this just sums up in a fairly candid way, I would say, what I've just said. So you've got the learning one, the first one on the left, the structure and process at the bottom, and identity on the right. And as I say, spectrum from, you know, from non to uh, completely. And you might want to position, think about where you're positioned uh, in that kind of cube. There should be more cube, many cubes than that, but uh, on each of those things where your students are. And where you'd like to be. Which, is most, which of those three axes is most important for you? Um, and for them, and where is the, where are the challenges, and so on. Well, this uh, that's I'll come back to that again in, in a second. Uh, I've given you a handout. Oh, sorry, no, this one first. So this again, this is just summing up what I've just said. So you've got the behavioural, the emotional, and the cognitive side, and you've got the congruent there conformity, non-engagement, and the, as I said, I don't like the word, but the oppositional, or the challenging, whatever. And some examples of what students might do uh, under each of those. Okay. So that's just summarising. Okay, the QAA have uh, just very recently developed a student engagement chapter on their new quality code, 
Uh, and it's longer than this, but I just pull down to the two points. So you've got the big indicator, and then um, lots of, uh, lots of sub subsections of that. So just over, for two minutes, very, very quickly, we haven't got much time, I'd like you to just have a look at that and, and offer any comments. time having a reasoned and an enthusiastic and a participatory approach to the lectures and things that you're learning but questioning them and rejecting them not from a position of marching and picketing and being outside the institution but being within it and questioning what you're being taught and, thing and what, the, what is there and if there is then if this became part of that although it's encouraging talk does it also still then reinforce the idea that the institution does hold all the power ultimately and so then that rejection will be quashed almost you know but it has to be assimilated and how long would that discussion be cut take if, if there was a real feeling of no we don't agree with this but academic integrity and the frameworks of the institution believe that it has to be there you know does it create that kind of change that, that's, that's a real danger, isn't it? I absolutely agree. Constructive criticism is, would be the ideal. I agree it's going to take a lot of resources to do this properly, and I agree there's a danger that students will come, and if it's not done fully, uh, and they don't, they don't feel their voice is being listened to really, then there'll be alienation and so on. That's one of the things that we picked up from the literature, the so-called closing the loop, you know, listening to students, taking action, and closing the loop by telling students what action you've taken is really important. And if you forget that last one, you lose them, even if you have taken action. And they do exactly what you're, what you're saying. Perhaps one more for you. Yeah, yeah uh, Indicator 7 stands out for me, again, in relation to what Peter has mentioned, in relation to the conformists and the, uh, the rebels, which I like that term. Uh, <laughs> uh, because it, it as a statement itself, the effectiveness of students' engagement was using predefined key performance indicators, etc. You know, the whole idea is, uh, I think for me, there's a danger of not only making conformists out of students, but conformists out of academics and staff who might have you know, quite outlandish ideas. Uh, but there's a risk element to that, so therefore they might withhold that by sort of creative aspect of innovation, because at the end of the, the course, you'll be assessing after these predefined things. Absolutely. So it's kind of closing down the system. Yeah. Teaching to the test. Whenever you set up the indicators, you do actually structure 
practices, uh, and that's a danger too. Yeah, and I think for me, one of the I was involved with the on the steering group with development of this, and this is the best iteration that we had. But when it started, it was all about it was all about quality, quality indicators. Of course, it's the quality uh, in, uh, agency, but um, if you're looking at student engagement, you mustn't forget that uh, exactly that, that the indicators will drive behavior. And if you're driving behavior only in one direction, you're forgetting certain elements of student engagement that, that can be important. Thank you. Okay. I, I disagree oh, sorry. with some of the points. So since I disagree with some of the points on the uh, really the same thing that makes it the behaviors that were less than Absolutely agree. I mean, that's the, that's the difficulty of only looking at behaviours and not looking at the other things, the reasons for behaviours, so on. But yeah, skipping lectures, but doing the work and talking to the lecturers is not a problem. So I like it's they are the behaviours. I agree. It's, it is. Registers, um, my memory of registers was when I was a boy in the primary school. <coughs> and when I first went into education uh, as, a, as, a, as a teacher, I saw these, these registers, and I'm now alarmed. I, I, I mean, I'm, in fact, I have nightmares about this. I have a whole <laughs> universal sector that, you know, the, the great temple of, of voluntary, voluntarism. <coughs> Rejection and contestation <coughs> is, uh, is, 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 is suffering the dead hand of the register. Now, I don't, my understanding was that uh, traditionally seven out of four, seven out of ten was obligatory. And I have painful memories from my graduate days and postgraduate days on that issue. But I understand that increasingly registers are being used for lectures. It's the border agency. And this is what I mean about, about um, larger structures conditioning. Practices. It's the border agency that is beginning to control as it has done in the university university practices. But that's deeply disturbing. So you have to keep ready to ensure basically that your really the issue is your overseas students attend, but you can't target over just overseas students, that would be the right thing to do. So actually you have to keep registers on everybody, but the real legend the chief is overseas students. So you know that, that illustrates the environment that we're in. I, I need to move on quite quickly. Um, I think what's missing from that is the third thing about identity, actually. Uh, there's a lot about quality and there's a lot about enhancing learning in the first and second uh, axis, and then obviously representation and so on. It's very interesting, I'll just point you out so that we'll say anything uh, more about it. Very interesting study just come out. Uh, uh, on that, and they, their findings from empirical studies uh, of uh, undergraduate courses uh, basically are that Axis 1, teaching and learning, and particularly engagement with knowledge, uh, has a big effect on Axis 3, identity, and change in the student, and changing, them, changing their own identity and so on, and for these authors, that latter thing uh, is, is really important. Identity change, that's what higher education really is about. You know, you're a different person, a uh, more critical person, uh, and you think differently and so on. Uh, of course, that varies from discipline to discipline, exactly how, how that's manifested. Um, so engagement with knowledge leading to identity change uh, 
is, is, the, is the significant point I'd say from this study. And I think that, that third axis um, is, is a bit absent from, uh, from the QA chapter. I've mentioned educational ideology, and I think it's, it's really important. We, we, in the Leadership Foundation uh, materials, we call it philosophy. <laughs> we go away from the word ideology because ideology has a, you know, has a negative connotation it shouldn't to have an eye. I'm certainly not using it in a negative way. Uh, but it permeates a lot of what we do. And in some other work, I talked about four educational ideologies in higher education. Traditionalism, concentrating on the uh, discipline. Progressivism, concentrating on the student. Social reconstructionism, concentrating on Changing society and enter what I call enterprise, um, in other words, supervisionism and contributing to UK PLC, as it's sometimes called. And we see those uh, manifested, I think, in two different models of student engagement. And I think there's some contestation right now in this country and abroad between those two models. One we call the market model of student engagement, I think you can see it uh, to some extent in the QA chapter. In other words, seeing students as uh, consumers uh, entering the higher education market, <coughs> consumers who must be satisfied, um, as opposed to a de developmental model of student engagement, uh, which sees them as participants in the process uh, of education, of their own education, of being fully involved, not as consumers, but as, as, uh, as fully involved participants. And those are manifested in two different approaches to evaluating what happens in universities. I would say that the uh, National Survey of Student Satisfaction embodies the first one, the market model. Did you like it? You, know, you bought some beans, did you like them? <laughs> you had an undergraduate degree, did you enjoy it? <laughs> that sort of thing. It's, just, it's situating the student as a consumer. In Australia, in North America, uh, in piloting in South Africa, and piloting in China, and in some institutions here and other institutions in other countries in, in, in the rest of the world, they're using a, an engagement survey. So in, in North America, for example, you have NESI, the National Survey of Student Engagement. In Australia, you have Aussie, and so on. Yeah. Uh, so that's, they're asking different questions, and as we said before, the, the questions that are in, in uh, Australia, there are, there are funding consequences to Aussie. Um, and Nessie in North America has important implications. So people try to get good answers to those questions, and they're questions like, you know, were you involved? Did the lecturers discuss that about with you? Were there representatives? Did you have an opportunity to do this. In other words, those engagement questions ask about processes of education, not about outcomes or satisfaction of uh, outcomes. And I think uh, it's really hard to move all the way to partnership if you're involved in this, behind your question, I think, uh, if you're taking a market model of student engagement. Uh, so, engagement for what? I mentioned that there were multiple purposes for engagement. <coughs> and so these are some of the things that we abstracted from the literature. And there's a gap there because there are probably different types of roles interested in the top and interested in the lower. And some pointers, again, that we abstracted from the literature. I'll talk about the empirical work. Uh, the DEEP project, there's um, a lot of uh, very good materials, little handbooks and things in uh, the states stemming from the Documenting the Effect of Educational Practices uh, project. And our website is a bit So these are the things that uh, they've identified and seem to be key indicators of success from what we can see from the literature and also from our own group of work. <coughs> the 
again, some of them in some context might be seen as quite radical. What did we find <coughs> from our interviews? Well, uh, and we, we, as I say, we went to case study institutions which on a number of uh, identifiers were highly engaging institutions and we weren't doing sample and that resources for that. So we just wanted to ask the question, what do, what do where are the roots of success in those institutions? Uh, and this one identifies people at the top. I said we shouldn't overemphasize individuals, but it, the, the literature on change in the universities generally tells us that it's really important to have somebody with power who is you know, on your side. If you need to get things done, it's not a, it's not a, you know, <laughs> it's not a, a, a an obvious point. But, uh, so somebody with connect. Students having a proper voice, co-producers in all aspects. See how radical that's a kind of that's on the on the fairly you know, high end of uh, the spectrum that I was talking about. So it's a bit of a journey according to this person. Mention me to mention the power relationship. Of course, you can't get away from it. The, the institutions and the people, the people in it do have power. Uh, but it's been a building on from that and trying to get around uh, that to offer uh, <coughs> to students for engagement. And this business about these different agendas, the eight uh, things that I was talking about just now. University wants and maybe that, that first quote is suggesting those different agendas, those different targets, objectives are not in conflict. Mm -hmm. To get the high rankings on student engagement at the scales, to get a better reputation and so on, actually you do have to do some real things that do involve uh, students in their learning and and so on. And again, you've got uh, a champion talking to deans and other senior managers about that to convince him. So I would agree with the senior manager. Same journey, different motivations, and it doesn't matter. In fact, it's a good fit because it, you know, everybody's involved. Um, what matters is the journey. And this uh, individual making the comparison, the analogy between industrial relations, employers and employees, students and, uh, and their universities, uh, from uh, exit Partnership and cooperation working together, not a conflictual uh, power-based give and take uh, bargaining thing, but uh, cooperation is what they're trying to do. So, some of the success factors, the key to critical success factors that um, we've abstracted from the literature and abstracted from the empirical work then, um, I'll let you read them for yourselves, I'll just pick out one or two things. Goat and goal. I was giving a talk to the NUS and the HEA uh, and I was talking enthusiastically about uh, uh, engagement and so this is satisfaction so and one of the NUS stood up quite angrily and said, we've had enough of bloody surveys. You know, if we're fed up of filling in bloody forms, come and talk to us. Hmm. Yes, good point. <laughs> Perhaps I should be a bit less. There's only so much that surveys and questions uh, can do. And really, it needs to be So it goes and goes. Even structures, university structures, are um, mitigated against uh, student engagement. So, that, you know, 
to keep an eye on those all the time. I mentioned the closing the feedback. Not being a manager. <laughs> so it's practice theory ev evoked responses. See somebody in a suit, looks like a manager, talks like a manager, and so on. It evokes a response. Or something else. But those kind of evoked responses, social practice theory really says are very important and you need to think about um, what, what responses you're evoking in your discourse, in your written stuff, in how you behave. So, really, what we're saying is that. You need, if you're thinking about enhancing student engagement, you need to think about where you are at the moment on one side of the river, where you want to get to, particularly the three axes, <coughs> and uh, how you might get there. Um, and also, of course, the metaphor has you know, environment in it, climate, geography, and so on, Stand on it and all of the things that we're thinking about uh, moving along in students and student engagement. So, in that, then, in doing that, in thinking about crossing, making the bridge and crossing the bridge, you need to think about the three dimensions of student engagement. So think about not only the future, but where we are now. What are, what are our recurrent practices? What are our assumptions about our students? What's possible within within this context? Uh, what resources are we got? And some of the, the key lessons about change. <coughs> and if you go to any talk that I give, you'll hear these three words: salience, congruence, and probability. To be successful, change has to be salient. It has to matter uh, to, to people with the um, issues, the agendas uh, that they have. If it doesn't, then it will eventually be, be sooner or later just nothing. Uh, there might be uh, compliance for a while, but eventually it has to be important to people. Congruence. What you're planning to do needs to be to some extent congruent with uh, what uh, current practices are at the moment. If they're entirely incongruent, it's not going to happen. Obviously, practices need to change and they will change. It's not just Status quo, but uh, that, that doesn't need to be congruent. And profitability, not in terms of money, but in terms of what matters to those people involved. And usually for academics, it's time. Time is the key thing that you always hear from academics. What do you want? I want more time. I've got too many things to do. So if something is about resources, if something is going to, if an, if an innovation towards student engagement is going to cost you time, it's another thing to do, and so it's not. There must be ways to find it to be profitable. Um, okay, I think I've talked about it. So, you know, if you if you want to reflect later on today or in the future, then uh, those are some of the questions that I think uh, you can reflect on. Um, and then I mentioned the resources. <coughs> the HEA reports are up their site, the other Leadership Foundation reports are up their site. The Sakai engagement site, the interactive one, uh, has everything on it from all the sides. So just log in with those details. These slides I'm sure will be available uh, to you. Some examples of um, uh, materials from the NUS themselves, because they're working on this, of course, very strongly at the moment too. And then uh, the examples from Messi and Aussie that I mentioned. Deep project guides and the full hand, hand project report. And also, um, there is one of the more useful things. Uh, is the student engagement toolkit for managers, one of our deliverables. 
uh, which contains uh, those things. Okay, I'm slightly over time, but we did have a bit of discussion before, so I think we've just got five minutes. Can we call comments, questions, issues? Uh, Bob, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, thanks, Paul. Um, just was occurring to me as you were talking that, that there's a heavy emphasis on the literature you reviewed and uh, uh, an evidence in the in the uh, QAA found out that was that increasingly student engagement is viewed as a kind of a systemic. You know, it's it's a it's a series of things you do. Uh, but the question in my mind is is if you want to comment on how, how uh, far do you think or do you feel that staff engagement is a kind of necessary precursor to effective student engagement? <laughs> yes, our focus has been on student engagement, but you're absolutely right. And uh, one of the one of the things I skipped over very quickly is say to choose the right people, uh, and that's one one uh, thing in terms of selection. You know, how committed are are uh, so to uh, student engagement? Usually there are, but there are some unfortunately uh, to be less so. But uh, in terms of the staff that were already there, absolutely. If the staff are alienated and disengaged uh, from the institution, from their work, for whatever reason, of course they're not going to. It's about profitability and salience and confidence and so on. If, the, if their work and being excellent in their work in this regard is not salient to them, so I absolutely kind of agree if you're making a point uh, that that's important. Well, will staff exhibit the same uh, characteristics of individual differences as students do? Of course. So, so we also have rebellious and innovative staff. <laughs> yes, and we do. Indeed. Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes. Uh, Bob, the, the social practices approach, is, I mean, I, one of the things that, I, that always attracts me about that is how it does do all the things there that we're talking about, bringing students in and making a dialogue part of what, how we shape things and it all develops from there. And it reminds me very much of adult literacy as well that I used to be involved in and, and how that was where all staff and all, all the, the theoretical discussions seemed to go for a large part, but we ended up with functional skills. And it's like, how do you get that point where there is a great sense of this is how people feel enriched and empowered and how we can develop courses but it's in the face of a government agenda and a policy agenda that also runs this, which is saying, yeah, we want the NSS, we don't want this open shared thing. What we do want the kind of beams approach to your ideas, and if we're not doing it right, then you hit with that. And how do the two, do you think, fit together for, for you as a practitioner and for us and for institutions that we've got that that drives everything where the money comes from? And so although these are brilliant ideas and can really develop what we do, they're in the face of that, which is going the other direction. Yeah, I know, uh, and it's if, you know it's depressing, isn't it? Uh, so much <laughs> is taking it towards the quality agenda, you know, narrowly conceived, uh, towards a market model, towards <coughs> satisfaction, and so on. Uh, but I don't think we ought to be, you know, we're not dupes. We're not social dupes, and that's one thing that social practice theory says. You know, we're not just puppets of the situation that we're in, of course we're not, and especially not in universities and, and, and higher education centres. We're clever people, and we can think this through, and we can recognise, as you've just done, what's happening. And that's really important. I wrote a paper uh, in 2001 called uh, Captured by the Discourse? Question mark. In other words, you know, are, do, do we eventually sink into a closed uh, or do we necessarily seek into a closed discourse about things? I wasn't looking then at student engagement, but you know, you can apply to that as a very limited view. And my conclusion was, I hope I'm right, that no, you know, you can apply your mind to it. And one of the things is to surface all this and to point it all out and to keep it in mind all the time. But it takes work to, to challenge the discourse uh, of of the market and, and all of the other sides. So it's, a, it's effort, it's resources, and as I say, time on the issue. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to talk any other comments to people who ask questions. What's one, I think? Just a minute.
Regarding Catholic discourse, and in particular, um, I think the, the one of your other sources, Paul uh, Fairclough, uh, wrote a fascinating book um, years and years ago about the Labour language or the new Labour language. And uh, what, what, what was fascinating about that was that um, Norman crystallised this nasty destruction of distinctions and uh, the way the way that then um, uh, then the Orthodox the Catholic uh, Party tried to say there were no divisions, there were no there were no uh, contestations, that we were all in together. Goodness me, I'll use yeah, yeah. that term again, yeah. which is really just an attempt philosophy recycle, of course. And I just wonder whether this uh, we, we're into an era of, of what could be called honest debate, honest uh, honest disagreement. Uh, that, you know, for, for, a, for a period of time in this country, um, what we call sharp ideological differences were, 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 were either ignored or defined out of existence. And some people say, well, you know, come bring back the good old 1980s. And in a funny sort of way, we're entering a period now in, the, um, in this country's uh, macroeconomic management where you know, we, there is a degree of content contestation. Yeah. I wonder whether this is going to actually produce well, that's, Thank you. That's so optimistic and nice, a nice thought. And it reminds <laughs> me, actually, when we're talking England, go to Scotland. They have the quality enhancement framework. Very nice, you know, with universities as autonomous people making their own decisions and so on. So there is that difference and, and the potential for contestation and so on. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to kind of go back to these QIA indicators again. I, I, the more I look at them, the more I begin to question whether they are consistent with each other mm. as a set of indicators that could be implemented by any institution. Mm. I wonder is, is this a sort of I wonder has this really been examined to see if this is these things are consistent with each other and actually make sense to try and achieve all at once. Yeah. Well, the working group met about three or four times, and there was a national consultation. I mean, you probably missed it. Um, just uh, finished it two or three months ago. Uh, maybe you didn't, I don't know. Uh, but they haven't been piloted in any sense. And in a way, what's happened, I think, with these is that they've been, they have been improved. I mean, one of the early ones was about that students and institutions should get together and define student engagement. Well, I'll tell you what, having spent 30 months trying to do exactly that, I thought the chances of that ever happening uh, were, were nil, which was a point I made, so that's not there. Um, but, uh, but no, I mean, I, think, I still think there are lots wrong with these things, and I think they are inconsistent. But I do think, actually, they have the advantage that they're pretty broadly drawn now, so you could... There is a, there is a space for institutional autonomy to make their own definitions and to do it their way. So in that sense, I'm not too concerned with that. I suppose I, I, suppose I look at them and, and I see the things that the managerial types will yes. single out yeah. and ignore the things that are inconvenient. So that, you know, the, the thing that <laughs> you know that students and staff engaging in discussions that aim to bring out a demonstrable enhancement of the educational experience. I think that is the part that is hardest to achieve and will be conveniently swept away and you know the number seven will be kind of key performance indicators discussing data with students that love that. I, 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 we're going to the opposite of the pessimistic <laughs> so, <laughs> things again and again you know, oh god but you're of course I'm sure you're absolutely right partly because it's easier you know, quantitative stuff and so on is just easier than engaging in discussions that are not just a talking shop but actually do something <coughs> talking of which I'm, I'm over my time, so I'm going to stop there. Thank you so much for a very good